Hello and welcome to part two of the case from the case files and internal medicine book about the cirrhosis. Probable hepatitic C related cirrhosis case. And today we will continue where we stopped in part one. We stopped, we spoke of the, the approach, the pathophysiology of cirrhosis and some other very nice things. Go to part one to read it now. We'll continue from ascites. Of course, I had this small problem in part one where I said the word ascites as ascites. Apparently, it was never ascites. It was always ascites. Ascites. Or as the Westerner says, ascites. So I apologize for the, all, the, all the ascites I said in part one, because apparently I always spoke the word wrong. I heard it many times, but I kept saying it wrong, you know. My my brain cancellator or something, so it's ascites, okay? Ascites, ascites, okay. So we'll continue now in part two for uh, this case about liver cirrhosis, and we'll continue from the ascites after having a nice cup of coffee. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse the many cuts. The most common cause of ascites is portal hypertension as a consequence of cirrhosis. The pathogenesis involves a combination of decreased effective circulatory blood volume because of portal hypertension, which is the underfill theory, also involves inappropriate renal sodium retention leading to expansion of plasma volume which is the overfill theory and thirdly involves decreased plasma oncotic pressure so the pathogenesis info involves a combination of decreased effective circulatory blood volume because of portal hypertension inappropriate renal sodium retention leading to expansion of plasma volume and decreased plasma oncotic pressure. When not caused by portal hypertension, ascites may be a result of exudative causes such as infection or malignancy. The patient usually presents with abdominal swelling and demonstration of free fluid by physical examination or imaging procedures such as ultrasonography. It is important to try to determine the cause of ascites in order to look for reversible causes and for serious causes, such as malignancy, and to guide therapy. Ascitic fluid is obtained by paracentesis and examined for protein, albumin, cell count with differential, and culture. The first step in trying to determine in trying to determine the cause of ascites is to determine whether it is caused by portal hypertension or by exudative or by exudative process by calculating the SAG S A A G which is serum ascites albumin gradient equals serum albumin minus ascitic albumin and there's a table here for the differential diagnosis of ascites based on SAG, S-A-A-G, which is serum ascites albumin gradient. This table over here. Pause, if you'd like to pause, over there. Differential diagnosis of ascites based on SAG. So either high gradient or low gradient. High gradient is above 1.1 gram per deciliter. The, and that is portal hypertension and otherwise low gradient which is less than 1.1 gram per deciliter and that is non-portal hypertension and the causes of each so if high gradient more than 1.1 gram deciliter is hypertension and the differential diagnoses are cirrhosis portal vein thrombosis but carry syndrome congestive heart failure constrictive pericor constrictive pericarditis. If it is low gradient, the SAG was low gradient, which is less than 1.1 gram per deciliters, so it is non-portal hypertension, the differential diagnosis is peritoneal carcinomatosis, peritoneal carcinomatosis, tuberculous peritonitis, pancreatic ascites, 
bowel obstruction or infarction, serositis, example as in lupus, and nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic syndrome. So, the treatment of ascites usually consists of dietary sodium restriction coupled with diuretics. Loop diuretics are often combined with spironolactone to provide effective diuresis and to maintain normal potassium levels. Spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is a related, so now the important subject, now we'll talk about spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is a relatively common complication of ascites, thought to be caused by translocation of gut flora into the peritoneal fluid. Symptoms include fever and abdominal pain, but often there is paucity of signs and symptoms. Paucity. Paucity. Signs and symptoms. Diagnosis is established by paracentesis and finding more than 250 polymorphonuclear neutrophils per cubic millimeter or by positive culture. Culture of acidic fluid often fails to yield the organism. However, fluid cultures, when positive, usually reveal a single organism most often gram-negative enteric flora, but occasionally enterococci or pneumococci. This is in contrast to secondary peritonitis, for example, as a consequence of intestinal perforation, which usually is polymicrobial. Empiric therapy includes coverage for gram-positive cocci and gram-negative rods, such as, and, such as intravenous ampicillin, and gentamicin, or a third-generation cephalosporin, or equinolone antibiotic. Okay? So, we'll go back to a table uh, about, for the, about the complications of cirrhosis. Uh, we'll read the table about the complication of cirrhosis. So, we have disorder, diagnosis, clinical presentation, and treatment. So, disorder, portal hypertension, diagnosis, Diagnosis is made by the appearance of the features described earlier and evaluation of portal blood flow using Doppler ultrasonography. Clinical presentation of portal hypertension. Clinical features are related to portal hypertension and its sequelae, which is ascites, splenomegaly, hypersplenism, hypersplenism, hypersplenism encephalopathy, and bleeding varices. So that's the clinical presentation of portal hypertension. Treatment, non-selective beta blockers, such as propranolol, lower portal pressure. During acute variceal hemorrhage, sandostatin or octreotide causes splanchnik vasoconstriction. Next, the disorder, ascites, diagnosis of ascites made by finding free peritoneal fluid on physical examination or on an imaging study. Clinical presentation of ascites, abdominal distension, sometimes with peripheral edema. And treatment, sodium restriction, spironolactone, loop diuretics, large volume paracentesis. Next is spontaneous bacterial peritonitis in this table. The diagnosis can be made when the ascitic fluid contains more than 250 polymorphonuclear neutrophils per cubic millimeters and confirmed with a positive culture, as we mentioned earlier. The most common organisms are Estrichia coli, Estrichia coli, Klebsiella, other enteric flora, enterococci, and pneumococci. And clinical presentation of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis abdominal pain, distension, fever, decreased bowel sounds, or sometimes few abdominal symptoms but worsening encephalopathy. Treatment in case of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, so IV antibiotics such as sifotaxime or ampicillin slash solbactam. 
Okay, and this is all. And now finally, we'll move to the clinical pearls of this case, the cl clinical pearls, the, this section over here. The most common causes of cirrhosis are alcohol use, hepatitis B and C, and autoimmune disorders. Hepatitis C is most commonly contracted through blood exposure. Hepatitis C is most commonly contracted through blood exposure. And rarely through sexual contact. Most patients are asymptomatic until they develop complications of chronic liver disease. A serum ascites albumin gradient more than 1.1 gram per deciliter suggests that ascites is caused by portal hypertension as occurs in cirrhosis. Treatment of cirrhotic ascites requires sodium restriction and usually diuretics such as spironolactone and furosemide. And furosemide. And furosemide. 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 And furosemide. Spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is infection of the ascitic fluid characterized by more than 250 polymorphonuclear cells per cubic millimeter, sometimes with a positive monomicrobial culture. Thank you very much for watching and listening. And this is all for our cirrhosis case from this book. And see you, inshallah, in the next video. And please don't forget to share, like, and subscribe and leave a comment and thank you very much for watching